All right, this begins our unit concerning biochemistry or the chemistry of life. And we begin our study with the nature of matter. And so we'll be looking at atoms first because atoms are the fundamental unit of matter. Uh, and I'm going to assume that you have some background in atomic theory. In other words, you have learned something about uh, the structure of the atom. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So we call the smallest unit of matter an atom, and we name it, or we call it an atom because of Democritus, who approximately 2,500 years ago, YA years ago, um, came up with the concept that there must be something so small that you can't divide it any further. In other words, if you take any bit of matter, anything in the universe, and cut it in half, and cut the half in half, and cut the quarter in half, and just keep cutting it in half, and half, and half. Eventually, you're going to get to something that you can't divide any further. So he conceptualized it, but he didn't know what atoms were. He didn't know the structure of the atom. He just came up with the idea, and that's why we call atoms atoms, based on the word atomos, which means can't be divided. Now, we know that's not true that you can split the atom, and atoms are made up of these things called subatomic particles. But atoms are really, really small. 100 million will make a row about one centimeter long. That's really small. They're made up of subatomic particles, as I just mentioned, subatomic, sub meaning below the atomic level. So this figure here represents a whole atom but you can tell from the little spheres here in the nucleus that it's made up of particles that are smaller than the atom as a whole. So they're below the level of the atom, subatomic. There are three primary subatomic particles that you've probably heard of before. Uh, if nowhere else, like on a cartoon, like Jimmy Neutron, protons, neutrons, electrons, right? Three primary subatomic particles. So getting a little deeper into uh, comparing those subatomic particles, protons and neutrons have the same mass. Now in this figure, they're showing protons, neutrons, and electrons as spheres approximately the same size. That's completely uh, inaccurate when it comes to the electrons. The electrons, if depicted in relation to their size to neutrons and protons, would be almost invisible. They're very, very, very they have very, very little mass, is the way I should say that. Um, but protons and neutrons have the same uh, uh, the same mass. Protons are positively charged and neutrons are neutral. So hopefully, because proton starts with a P, you'll remember positive for proton, and neutrons start with an N, and neutr, neutro, neutral, right, for neutral. So hopefully that'll be easy for you to remember and keep straight. Electrons have a negative charge, and here's where I just mentioned they have a minuscule mass, so minuscule that they're not even considered when considering the overall mass uh, of the atom, what we call the atomic mass. So it's 1 1840th the mass of a proton or a neutron. Minuscule. Protons and neutrons make up the atomic nucleus, not to be confused with the cell nucleus, right? You need to keep that straight in your mind. And I point that out because I've seen students become confused. I'll ask a question on a test about the, the atomic nu nucleus, and I'll get an answer back saying something about the um, control center of, of a cell. Uh, so don't confuse them. Here we're talking about the nucleus of an atom, not the nucleus of a cell. Electrons orbit the nucleus, just like the moon orbits the Earth and the Earth orbits the sun. Electrons are kept in the atom by their attraction to the positively charged protons. So you probably know that opposites attract, right? Negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged protons. That's what keeps them orbiting the nucleus of the atom, similar, again, to the moon orbiting the Earth and the Earth orbiting the sun due to gravity. Gravity keeps the Earth from flying off into space. The electrons don't fall into the nucleus, and the Earth doesn't fall into the Sun because they are moving. They And you, you can think of them, when you think of an orbit, think of falling around. That's really what's happening. When the Moon is orbiting the Earth, the Earth is orbiting the Sun, 
it's falling around the sun. The moon's falling around the earth. The electrons are falling around the nucleus. It's just that they're moving so fast that they orbit. Instead of fall into, they orbit. In any typical atom, meaning stable and uncharged, there are equal numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So you'll notice here in the helium atom, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. That's a normal, stable, uncharged atom. This means the overall charge is neutral um, because the positive charged protons balance the negatively charged electrons. So the overall charge is what we call that. The overall charge on the atom is neutral. There are charges within the atom, but because they balance out, the overall charge is neutral. So there are, <clears throat> um, you can change the number of atomic uh, particles, subatomic particles. So you need to keep straight what happens to an atom when we change the number of subatomic particles. So a different number of protons makes that atom a different element. If you change the number of protons, you have changed the atom into a different element. So for example, here we're looking at helium. If this had one less proton, we'd be looking at hydrogen. If it had one more proton, we'd be looking at lithium. If you change the number of protons, it changes the atom from one element to another. A different number of neutrons may be unstable and radioactive, but either way, even if it's not, it's called an isotope. So an atom with a different number of neutrons is an isotope. So for example, if this helium atom had either one less uh, neutron or one more neutron, it would be an isotope of helium. It would still be helium because it has two protons. It's the number of protons that makes an element that element. But if it had a different number of neutrons, it would be an isotope of helium. And a different number of electrons. Notice that electrons are, or remember that electrons are negatively charged. So that if you take away an electron, you're going to leave behind extra positive charge and the overall charge on the atom is going to be positive. If you bring in another electron, add an electron, you're bringing in a negative charge and there's going to be an overall negative charge to the atom. That's what we call an ion. So a charged atom, or a charged particle in general, is referred to as an ion. So you need to keep these straight. You need to remember these and keep them straight. Vocabulary. It's basically just vocabulary. Of course, we didn't know this, always know this, about uh, the atom and the nature of matter. Um, a long time ago, there were scientists, at least they called themselves scientists, and they were scientists, but there was a little bit of wizardry mixed in, uh, and they were known as alchemists. They, had, they identified only four elements. So instead of all the elements that we see in the periodic table, that's what we're looking at here, the periodic table, they felt that all matter was made up of four basic elements, and those were earth, air, fire, and water. Sounds like... Uh, avatar, doesn't it? So an element is defined as one or more of the 100 pure constituents of matter that differ in their number of protons, in their elemental form, not chemically combined, in other words, compounded with other elements. We're talking pure. So a, a pure element is made up of only one kind of atom. Pure nitrogen, for example, or pure carbon or pure oxygen. It's only made up of one kind of atom, and, it, and it's not combined with other atoms, so it's not like H2O, hydrogen, and oxygen put together to form water. That's an element. They're represented, the elements are represented on the periodic table with letter symbols of one or two letters. And they're arranged into the periodic table. And a lot went into this arrangement, and there are all kinds of rules and reasons for this arrangement. But you'll notice, but you'll notice that they're arranged in sequence um, by atomic number. The reason we're looking at this periodic table with a sun or star behind it is because that's where the elements came from. 
Most elements are forged by fusion reactions in stars. Stars are furnaces that burn elements like hydrogen and helium, small elements, hydrogen and helium, the, some of the smallest elements in lithium, um, and they, in the process, they fuse them. So this is a fusion reaction in suns and stars that put smaller elements together into larger elements, and that's where the larger elements come from. So they only come from stars, and some of the largest elements actually have to come from a supernova an explosion uh, of an, a, uh, an old star. So an element's atomic number is its number of protons. So these are the numbers that are on top in this periodic table, and I chose this table because it only shows the atomic number. And as you can see, there's a trend in the number. Um, as you go from left to right, the atomic number increases. And as you go from top to bottom, the atomic number increases. So there's a general increase from the top left to the bottom right in atomic number. As of 2018, there are 118 known elements. Actually, we've uh, known these elements in, since about 2010. <clears throat> but only 94 occur naturally on Earth. So in other words, the rest of them have to be forced into existence by chemists. There are over 25 elements found in living organisms, but there's a big 10 that makes up the vast majority of living things. And that would be carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, potassium, and calcium. Those are the big 10 that you'll find in your body. Your body's made up primarily of these 10 elements. There are other numbers that you'll find typically uh, with the elemental symbols on a periodic table. And, uh, and we're looking at carbon here as an example because carbon is so important to life. Uh, you're almost 20% carbon. Your body is made up of almost 20% carbon, so there's more carbon in you than, than uh, other elements. In other words, we are carbon-based life forms. All life on this planet is carbon-based. So anyway, um, an element's mass number, that's what we're seeing here below the elemental symbols. So the elemental, the, this, the, uh, this is the atomic number. Six here for carbon is the atomic number, but below is the mass number. The total number of protons and neutrons. Now, if you count up the total number of protons and neutrons that we're seeing in this nucleus, you'll notice that it adds up to 12. Not 12.011. What's the uh, decimal all about? Well, there are isotopes, if you'll recall, uh, of different elements. So, for example, carbon uh, has three isotopes. And so what, we're, what we see here reported as the atomic mass is actually the combined or the average masses of all the isotopes taking into account their abundance. So there's more carbon-12 than the other two isotopes of carbon-13 and 14. So they are averaging the masses of the three isotopes, taking into account that there's more carbon-12 than there is carbon-13 or 14. So it's a weighted average, basically. So as I mentioned, carbon is especially important to life as we know it. Life is carbon-based, makes up 19.4% the mass of living matter. So like I said, almost 20% of your body. It, it, and it's because it forms organic biological compounds and, and which tend to be really big, right? So carbon will form long branching chains um, to make these really big biological organic compounds, which are the building blocks of life. So it's the reason it can form these long branching chains is, is because, because it can form four covalent bonds. And you, you're not familiar with what a, well, you may be familiar with what a co covalent bond is, but we're going to learn what a covalent bond is coming up. But it can form four bonds with itself and other atoms. <clears throat> That's very flexible. Uh, uh, not every atom can do that, but carbon can do that. Uh, so it, it makes it perfect for forming these big biological compounds that need to be very highly variable um, to carry out different functions. So the function of living things actually starts here at the chemical level uh, in the molecules that are formed primarily by carbon. So as I mentioned, um, carbon has different isotopes. 
and isotopes are identified by their atomic mass. So notice that the atomic number here between these two isotopes is the same. Six, right? Six pro uh, yeah, six protons. That's what makes carbon carbon. If you change the number of protons, it's no longer carbon. But because there are six protons in all three of the isotopes of carbon, that, may, that means it's carbon. Um, so what changes is the number of neutrons, if you'll recall. So there's carbon-12, which is the most abundant, kind of like normal carbon. There's carbon-13, which is the least carbon, and there's carbon-14, which is somewhere in between in its abundance. Isotopes have the same number of electrons, so we're not changing the number of electrons, we're not changing the number of protons, we're only changing the number of neutrons. So different isotopes have different numbers of neutrons, but because they have the same number of electrons, the electrons are what are involved in chemical reactions and forming chemical bonds with other compounds. So they have the same chemical properties. So carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, all three of them behave the same way. So, for example, you have some carbon-14 in your body right now. Even though it's slightly radioactive, um, you have some of it in your body right now and it's not hurting you. But there's a certain percentage of carbon-14 in our atmosphere, in our environment, and it gets incorporated into living things. So some isotopes are unstable and radioactive, like carbon-14, and they decay. Over time, they decay. They turn into other elements, as hopefully you learned when you uh, did the gizmo that I assigned previously. They're scientifically useful in a lot of different ways, and radiometric dating is, but that again, what that gizmo is all about. How do we know the absolute age? We can use these radioactive isotopes to measure the absolute age of things that contain them. Um, so radiometric dating is one scientific use. We can use them as chemical tracers. Um, we can, because they're radioactive, we can we can follow them in a living thing. So you could put carbon-14, for example, into a, a molecule, put the molecule into a living thing, and then be able to tell where that molecule goes because it's emitting uh, radioactive, it's emitting radiation. As you know, radiation is a treatment for cancer. Well, where does the radiation come from? It comes from radioactive isotopes. That's so they, they use radioactive isotopes that are emitting radiation to irradiate cancer, cancer cells and kill those cancer cells. We use it to kill bacteria on food. So for example, steak uh, or, or beef that's being processed and, and packaged to go on the, the grocery sh shelf can be irradiated to kill the bacteria that's on it so that it will last longer on the shelf. It won't spoil as quickly. Uh, nuclear power plants, so power generation, relies on the fact that there are these isotopes, radioactive isotopes like uranium, and inducing mutations. Um, just like we can use radiation to treat cancer and kill cancer cells, radiation mutates DNA. So we can use it to genetically manipulate living things, to change their genetic sequence, to uh, cause mutations, and sometimes those mutations are good and sometimes they're bad, but um, radiation has that effect on living things.